Well, good morning. And um, it is Christmas time, the season of Advent, and um, a little bit different, I am sure, for all of us. And um, we are celebrating um, who Jesus is and the light that he shines into our lives. And as I um, was preparing for today and praying and thinking and thinking of you, you know, there, there is a limitation as far as um, preaching. And, um, and that is, is that, you know, I think the most transformative sorts of conversations are more of the one-on-one. -on -one. And, um, you know, and, and if we were sitting down one-on-one -on -one together, the question that I'd want to ask you is, how are you doing? I mean, how is 2020 going for you? Hopefully well. You know, we've been trying to encourage one another, pray for one another, uh, do all that we can as a church family. Um, but it wouldn't be surprising if some of the things that you are feeling right now is frustration, fear, Stress, being overwhelmed, angry, sad. You know that it is altogether possible that Joseph from Nazareth, um, the, uh, the human father of Jesus, um, who raised him up, um, that he experienced all those things um, leading up to the first Christmas he was a builder, and he had been building his future. He was pledged to wed Mary. She was a good woman from a good family. He, he was almost undoubtedly working on actually building a home that they could have their family flourish and grow up in together. And, and then it all got swept away, like a tidal wave coming in and crashing and upending and sucking you out into the deep. Mary was pregnant and not by Joseph. Everything that he had hoped for, all of his dreams suddenly shattered and scattered. And yet, there was hope. God was at work. God actually sent an angel, a messenger to Joseph, bringing good news, shining light. Let me tell you what's really going on. This child is special. Accept him into your life. He's going to change the way that you live, he will dispel the fear, the doubt, the anger, the frustration. The three things, there are three things that we learn about the vision given to Joseph that are truths that give us all reason for hope, reason to invite, want, desire to have this child, this Jesus, come into our lives. The three things that we learn is that Jesus is God, Jesus is human, and Jesus is with us. Let me read for you Matthew's record of the event. This comes from Matthew chapter 1, beginning in verse 18. This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David... Do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife. 
because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel. If you're feeling frustrated, overwhelmed, exhausted, sad, angry, despairing, Jesus wants to come and shine his light into your life and to make a difference, to give you hope, to give you a future, to give you life. Three truths. Three truths given to us so that we will respond and we will invite Jesus in and he can begin to work this change in us. The first truth, Jesus is God. Plain as day, bold as the shining sun. This is the declaration. Jesus is God. Now, Matthew, I mean, after telling us the credentials of Jesus, and we heard that last week in the message. This is a son of David. This is a son of Abraham. But if you really want to know why you should trust Jesus, it's because of who he actually is. He is not only the one who was promised to come, he is the promiser. Now, Matthew, j just in this opening, but all through the gospel, if you were, you know, you start with the Christmas story and you work your way through, he gives us a whole bunch of reasons to understand and believe and to realize that Jesus is God. Right here from the very beginning, the angel telling Joseph, okay, I know your plans, I know you want to divorce her quietly, but you have to understand the child in her comes from God. You're, you're going to be the father to this child, but only in a secondary sense. God's calling you to be this child's father, to raise this child up. But the actual child was conceived by the Holy Spirit. Probably the strongest statement just in the Christmas story of the divinity of Jesus actually comes in verse 23 of Matthew. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. For centuries, Jewish scholars had known this prophecy, but they had not thought that it should be taken literally. They believed it was predicting the coming of some great leader and when that leader came, it would be like or as if God was with us. But Matthew is sitting here, and this is coming from the testimony of an angel. The promise was far greater than anyone imagined. It's not as if or like. But Jesus Christ, he is God with us. This child is literally God with us. Now, there is for a lot of people a mental hurdle here that they have a hard time getting over, just this claim of the divinity of Jesus. The most common thing is, is that if people want to reject it, they sit there and say, well, Jesus never really said something like this. This is just some sort of a legend or some sort of an idea that crept in later on, and this stuff just got made up. The divinity of Jesus is both central and foundational to all Christian claims. There is no convincing proof that the claim of Jesus' divinity finds it their source outside of the person of Jesus of Nazareth himself. That what we need to understand if, we're, if, we, if we have a mental problem with this idea that Jesus is claiming divinity is that it goes back to what Jesus claimed. There, there's no good argument that it, where it doesn't go back. Matthew is one of the disciples. He's a Jew. 
the Jewish people, of all of the people of the ancient world, were the least likely people to believe in the idea that God would become a human being. Eastern religions, they, they, would, they, they had a different view of God. They thought God was basically everything. And there could be some people where there would be like a high concentration of, of kind of divine consciousness and they could be an enlightened one. And so maybe something like somebody being divine or divine-like, you could go with that. Polytheism, they didn't believe um, in, in, in one God. They didn't believe in an omnipotent God, an omniscient God, a God had all power and all knowing. They believed there were many smaller little deities and none of them had it all together. And, and every once in a while they had stories where you know, one of these gods could you know, become human or appear as human and those things. But that was not the Jewish worldview. It, I mean, it, it's almost inconceivable for them to even, I mean, for us to imagine them claiming that a human being could be God. In Matthew's day, Jews wouldn't even take the divine name given to Moses, Yahweh, and utter it on their lips. We don't want to take that which is holy and profane it by human touch. And yet, Matthew and all of the first disciples were these Jews coming out of this very rigid worldview that said that there's one God and he is separate and he is and he is the creator he is all powerful and he is all knowing and he is holy and he doesn't want to be touched or contaminated by anything unclean there's no possible way and yet they all believe and the reason they believe is because of Jesus now However hard it may be for some people to, to just fathom the idea of God becoming a human being. I want to put forward that, you know, we have really credible arguments about why we should believe that Jesus made these claims. It's not a mental hurdle so much to imagine an all-powerful, infinite God becoming a human being. The real question is, did he actually do it? Should I believe the claims of Jesus? And you see, with Jesus, not only is there the reality of the claim, but he comes and he confronts us. And in that, the real issue is a personal crisis. Jesus forces you to make a decision about him. Do you believe what he claims about himself? Now, this Christmas time, we are celebrating that light has come. The light of Jesus is shining in all the world, for all the world to see. But here's part of the reality of light shining. In darkness, when the lights are low, things can stay hidden. But when the lights come on and you finally see, well, nothing is hidden anymore. And whether it's good news or whether it's bad news, when you have the light, you can finally see. Part of the message of Christmas is that there's love and goodness and joy, and you have reason for hope. However dark this world may be, you have reason for hope. But part of the message of Christmas is that there is darkness in your life that needs to be exposed and undone. So, my first car was a Plymouth Champ. And um, I kind of had a love-hate relationship with it. It was a good car overall. It was not the uh, prettiest car. But the biggest problem with that car, out of everything, was a smell. Every once in a while, this smell would emerge, and it, it smelled terrible. And, and, I, and I cleaned the carpets back in the back where this smell emanated from, like three different times, steam clean. And, and, it, and it wasn't always there. It just seemed like this odd thing where, I don't know, if the temperature was just right or if, like, the pressure change, you know, like the atmosphere, something. But this smell would come up, and when it was there, people would get, and they'd just be like, what is that? And then one day, I had to uh, get something, and, and so I 
lifted the carpet up and I lifted the little barrier up and then here was the spare tire and then this thing had fallen down and so then I had to take the spare tire out and when I took the spare tire out, lo and behold, what I found was the source of the smell. The light had come. Finally, this place that had been in shadows was finally revealed and it was this old curdled milk um, it was absolutely disgusting and uh, you know and then I cleaned it up and it finally took care of the smell and all of that stuff so I, I tell that story because there's this part where you see Jesus is making a claim to be God and and it's a claim where he is calling us to make a decision about him and there's all of this good stuff, but there's also the reality that he's saying, listen, there's stuff in your life, and it stinks. And, and your life isn't going to go well unless you deal with it. You see, Jesus makes this claim that no other great religious teacher has made. None of the other major religions has what we have in Christianity. We talked about this last week. This isn't just about good advice. You see, Jesus isn't just trying to be a moral teacher because he's not just a moral teacher. This is about good news, about what God has done, is doing, and will do. Read through the Gospels and you will see Jesus. He's... He's making a startling impact. People get it. They know that they have to respond to him. Some people hear and they see the light of Jesus and they fall down and they worship. Other people, when they hear what Jesus has to say, they try to push him off a cliff. Some of them will end up plotting his death. Others, like Matthew, turn their lives around. They give up their old way of life and they reinvent themselves and they become a disciple of Jesus. All of this because of the claims that Jesus makes about himself. He doesn't say that he knows the way to the light. He says, I am the true light that gives light to everyone. There is judgment. The light has come. You need to respond. C.S. Lewis famously confronted us with, with really understanding what, who Jesus is and what's being presented. You see, some people who want to reject the idea that Jesus made these divine claims, they just want to say, well, he was a good moral teacher. Jesus never claimed to just be a good moral teacher. He claimed something more than that. You can't just look at Jesus and say, oh, he's just one more religious person, one more advisor, one more person who will teach us about morality. A good moral teacher wouldn't make the claims that Jesus made. Jesus is either psychotic, somebody to be pitied, but somebody not to be listened to, or he's a liar and he knows full well that he isn't God and therefore he's evil and he's just trying to deceive us. Or he is who he claims to be. God. Come to save us and rescue us. Because he makes these claims and because we get confronted and because there has literally been billions of people through human history who have understood and responded, the, the claims of Jesus are before us today. It's not just that he lived 2,000 years ago, but the claim of Christianity is that he is alive today, and he is the only hope and salvation for this world. You've got to make a choice. He, he's calling you to follow him. And if you don't follow that's a choice. You can't just sit on the fence forever about Jesus. If you've heard his claims, now he's confronted you and you have to make a choice. He calls for movement, for action, for commitment, for faith. If you don't follow, that's a choice. Now, there are many people who claim that they believe in Jesus but they're not actually following Jesus. There's been no revolution of light. 
They've not really changed the way that they're living by his light. Are they saved? God knows. But they don't have any reason for assurance. This is what we can say for sure. When this world finally gets brought into the full light, when all the shadows are swallowed up in the sun, Jesus will come, set everything right, and there will be some people who come forward and they will sit there and say, Lord, Lord, in your name we did all these wonderful things, and Jesus will look at them and say, away from me, for I never knew you. Some people will hear just that warning, and they'll get discouraged and a little frustrated. Why does it have to be so harsh? But let me push back a little bit and say, I think our focus is in the wrong place. Instead of looking at the harshness, we just should look at the fact that this is what light does. It exposes things. This world is broken. There are terrible things that happen. That things are not the way that they're supposed to be. I, I, don't, I, I don't think there's a person that I know that would question that this world isn't broken. And at the foundation of this brokenness is the reality of death. God did not create us to die. He created us to be with him forever. And yet death reigns in this world and in this life. The coming of the light exposes the problem. Some people choose darkness. That's what they ultimately want. But the coming of the light also affirms hope. This life, this age, this season of brokenness, it's not all there is. There's more to come. There is a way of life and a quality of life where death and evil have no touch. There is hope beyond this grave. Jesus was raised from the dead. And because of Jesus, you and I have reason that we ourselves will be raised from the dead and to enter into a new quality of life that will be better and greater and there will be no more tears and all of the suffering and difficulties of this world will seem as nothing compared to what we have. And the way that Jesus brings this hope, which is captured right here in the Christmas story, it is the best of all possible hopes. If God were only holy, if this was all just a big moral tale and we just need moral advice, he would demand that we get our acts together but he would never sully himself by coming to earth. If God were just all accepting and all loving, and he just said, oh, sin isn't a big deal, and you can just do whatever you want, because evil and goodness are just a mirage, we would still be stuck in this situation. Here's a simple observation. Neither moralism or relativism would ever give us Christmas. The biblical God is both holy and he is absolutely loving and merciful. But he holds the holiness and the love together in perfection. He knows that we cannot pull ourselves up by our moral efforts. So he comes down to do for us what we could not do. He doesn't send somebody else but he comes himself. Jesus reaches out his hand, and this is God, and he says, trust me, should you? But the one who's holding out his hand, he holds together a hope of holiness and love, that the evil is evil and it's wrong, but it's going to be undone, and I care for you, and I'm here for you. The first great truth, Jesus is God. The second truth, Jesus is a human being. The witness of Christmas 
is that Jesus isn't just God, but that Jesus is a real human being. And that in a mind-blowing way that is really beyond, we don't fully comprehend, but, but he is fully God, and at the same time, he is fully a human being. Now, just at the level of just what this means, it is mind-blowing. It is, it is one of these things where he, there are truths here and ideas here that, that we humans have been struggling with for millennia. What is the nature of reality? What, what's really going on? What does it, what does it mean to be human? Is, 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 where is life found? Is it found in the one and everything's united, or is it found in the many? Is it... Is it temporary? Is it eternal? These questions which philosophy has been grappling with, Plato and Aristotle, Democrates and Heraclitus, these questions have been things that we humans understand at some level. We've got to try to figure out what things are so that we can live in congruence in the grain of the universe. And then we get the story of Christmas. And in the story of Christmas, the light of Christ comes and he explodes and he overcomes these questions and these, and these debates. In Jesus, the ideal has become real. The absolute has become particular. The invisible has become visible. The eternal has entered the temporal. The infinite and the finite are experienced together. Timothy Keller writes, the incarnation is the universe sundering, history altering, life transforming, paradigm shifting event of history. Again, people will come sometimes and they'll have these mental questions. And if you look at the incarnation, it is a mind blowing thing and it will actually answer the deepest philosophical questions that this world can ask. But not many of us are interested in, in philosophy at that level. But the story of the incarnation of Jesus becoming human, at the end of the day, it's not, again, just about mental stuff. It's about our real life, our practical life. And I want to give you two implications of Jesus becoming a human being that has power to change the way that we live the first one is this. The incarnation of God, that God actually became a real human being, means that there is infinite comfort, infinite comfort made available to us in our suffering. Let me read for you. This comes from Hebrews chapter 2. Begin reading in verse 14. Since the children have flesh and blood, he, Jesus, shared in their humanity so that by his death he might break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is, the devil, and to free those who all their lives were held in slavery by the fear of death. For this reason he had to be made like them, fully human in every way, in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God, and that he might make atonement for the sins of the people. Because he himself suffered when he was tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. When things are happy, when things are going well, it is easier for us to feel connected and feel like we belong to the rest of humanity. But when something bad happens, I mean really bad, and that, that suffering and that pain, one of the things that it often does is it creates a sense of isolation. You don't understand. You don't know what I'm going through. And, and, and then people come and they're well-intended and they share their sympathies. But oftentimes when they share their sympathies, they haven't gone through what we've gone through. And it is, again, isolating. I know you're trying to be nice, but if I was going to be honest, you, you, you have no idea what I'm going through. But every once in a while, there's somebody, and they've gone through what you've gone through. 
And, and there's an amazing thing that when, when you know somebody and they've gone through something similar to what you're going through and you're feeling the pain and you're in the midst of the suffering and you feel isolated and this person speaks into your life, you hear their words differently. It actually helps. There's comfort. So I had a, I was, you know, I experienced a call to be a pastor. And um, part of me loves the mental stuff. I, I, I love school. I love theology. I love to read the Bible and to explain it and teach it and all of that stuff. I was the youngest person in my class. I was ready to graduate. And I experienced God saying, you know, a piece of paper doesn't mean you're ready to be a pastor. And I knew what I lacked was um, the ability to really to provide pastoral care. I, I ended up doing clinical pastoral education. I became a chaplain. Um, and I, I've, I've read, I've studied, I've learned, I've done clinical training. But you know, I think the thing that helps me care for people the most and that's probably the most important thing is actually the suffering and wounds that I've been able to go through and I've experienced. I've had to deal with some of the trauma and abuse from my childhood. I now know what it's like to go through depression. I know what it's like to walk alongside family members who are just killing themselves. And I've actually had a, a, a brother who did kill himself. The most important thing for me in giving care is actually the suffering that I've gone through. We're, we're told, 2 Corinthians 1, it is out of the suffering that you've gone through and the comfort that you've received that you will be able to give comfort to others. The incarnation shines forth. God has suffered. Jesus triumphed through his suffering and it gives him infinite power to give comfort. Have you been betrayed? Have you been lonely? Have you been destitute? Have you faced death? So is Jesus. But, but pastors, somebody would say, I prayed to God and all I get is silence. I don't think he really cares about me. I've been crying out, but there's nothing there. Did you know that Jesus knows exactly what that's like? That Jesus cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And he wasn't just quoting Psalm 22. He was living it. He knows what that's like. but I feel like God has given up on me. Mm -hmm. Jesus knows what that's like. He knows what it's like to feel abandoned. The story of Christmas says God became a human being and he has been to all the places of our darkness. In fact, he plunged himself even, even further down into it. The fact that Jesus became a human being means that Jesus himself can give you comfort in all of your sufferings. The second thing that we learn from Jesus becoming a human being is he teaches us something about how to really live a good life. Greatness isn't found in climbing over everyone else and reaching the top. True life, if you want to really live, is found in loving service to others. Paul tells us this in Philippians 2. Who, being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage, but he humbled himself and he became a servant, taking on human flesh. If you want to find your life, you're going to go give your life in service. We see this in Christmas. We experience this in Christmas. It is better to give than receive. The Christmas spirit does not shine out in the Christian snob or the greedy Christian. 
Jesus shines forth a way of being where you willingly make yourself poor for the sake of others. A life of spending and being spent to help enrich others, giving time, helping in trouble, offering real care and concern. And not just to the people that are like you and that you like, but to everyone, however hard-hearted. If you want to live, Jesus shows us the way of true humanity. Go and spend your life in love and service to others. There are three truths contained in the name Emmanuel. Jesus is God. Jesus is a human being. And Jesus is with us. Now, I, I want to I talk about, because I think this is the most important thing, the implication of Jesus being with us. But to get there, I want to look at a lesson of what it means for Jesus to be with us. And it, it, is, it is a lesson that Joseph teaches us. Mary's pregnant, and Joseph knows that he's not the father. What he was going to do is he was going to break off the relationship. He, he's, he's just, he's righteous, he knows the law, he shouldn't marry her, she's committed adultery, but he's also kind and merciful and compassionate, so he sits there and he says, okay, I'll just do it quietly. God looks at his heart, loves him, sends an angel to him, marry her. She's pregnant through the Holy Spirit. But I want you to understand something that Joseph knows. Joseph knows that if he marries her, in that honor and shame society, it is going to end up being a life where people are going to look down on them. There's going to be people who sit there and say, Joseph, you aren't nearly as righteous as you thought. They are going to become second-class citizens. And one of the lessons that Joseph teaches us about Jesus with us is that the world is going to reject us. If you accept Jesus into your life, you can kiss your stellar reputation with the world goodbye. Move forward into the story of Jesus' birth and you realize it's not just reputation that's on the line. But there are dark spiritual forces that want to see us destroyed. And when Jesus came into the world, the Holy Family had to flee into Egypt because those dark spiritual forces with the face of Herod the Great, they wanted to consume and undo the Messiah. And Jesus says, if they persecuted me, they'll persecute you. In this world, you're going to have trouble. If you want to be with Jesus, it's going to take courage. We're beginning to see it more and more in our society. It used to be that going to church was a feather in your cap if you wanted to be part of respectable society. It was something that people look forward to. Now, even, even there, there was a certain sense that, but don't take it all too seriously, right? I mean, it's good that you go to church, but don't be one of those people who actually try to proselytize, share their faith. Keep your religion quiet. But that's not the life that Jesus is calling us to. He's calling us to a life of service and love where the greatest part of service and the greatest act of love that we can do is share Jesus with others. And the message, it's a hard message. There's good news to it. But part of the message is, is that, well... You stink. Your life is broken. You need to make some changes. And a lot of people who are drawn to Jesus, they're not willing to actually follow him as Lord. They say things like, I'm interested in Jesus, but not if it means I have to do X or Y. I want Jesus on my terms. But when it comes to this invitation, when it comes to the hand that is reaching out to us, this hand that says, let me bring you into life that's really life. 
It's not about your terms, it's about his terms. And it is scary and hard. Our, our whole culture is moving into this direction, to thine own self be true. The most important thing that you should listen to is just what you feel. Sound familiar? That's our society. Just listen to your feelings. You know what the Bible says? Your heart is deceitful above all things. Your feelings will sometimes betray you. There's this hand reaching out to you, inviting you. And, and part of the message is, is that you're going to have to give up control and allow him to lead you into life that's really life. So let me share to you what Jesus with us means. The hand is there. But will I take it? So, the story gets told. Best I can tell, it's a true story. There was a group of Navy SEALs. And they um, were doing um, a hostage rescue. And um, they, were, they were actually released, freeing hostages from a building where they were held captive in a dark part of the world. They flew in by helicopter. They made their way. They stormed into the room where the hostages had been imprisoned for months. All of the hostages who had been conditioned and formed by the fear and the darkness of these terrorists. They were curled up in a corner. The seals entered the room. They heard the gas of the hostages. They stood at the door and called to the prisoners, telling them they were Americans. And then they invited them, come, follow us. But the hostages refused. They sat there on the floor and they hid their eyes in fear. They had been broken. They weren't in a healthy place. They couldn't believe that their rescuers were really Americans. They stood there for a time, the seals, and they didn't know what to do. They couldn't carry everybody out. And then one of the seals had an idea. He put down his weapon, took off his helmet, curled up tightly next to the other hostages, getting so close his body was touching some of theirs. He softened the look on his face. He even put his arm around them. He was trying to show them that he was one of them. After some time, the hostages realized that there was no way that one of the guards would do what they had done. And then he whispered, we're Americans. We're here to get you out. Will you follow us? He finally, he stood to his feet. And he walked out, and they all followed. And you see, the story of the incarnation is God, Jesus is God, and he's also a human being. But most of all, he is the one who came to be with us, right where we are. He meets us here. He woos us. He lays down his life. He wraps his arms around us. He is the one who's stretching out his hand. And he's asking you to follow him. Will you pray with me? Loving Heavenly Father, we give thanks and praise for who you are and what you've done. May we live into the light that you shine. May we follow you, Lord Jesus, however difficult, however hard, even if the world rejects us, even if we have to suffer, even as we pour out our life in service and love to others. 
Lord Jesus, we believe in you. Give us strength, give us power, give us hope. In Jesus' name we pray.